Hey, what is going on, everybody? Welcome to the Super Lunch Bros Podcast, episode number 62. I am Brendan, and we got a lot to talk about. Uh, going mainly over uh, UFC 263, Israel Adesanya, dominant performance. We got uh, Davison Figueiredo versus Brandon Moreno, flyweight title fight. Leon Edwards versus Nate Diaz, spectacular show for that one. Uh, Damian Mayan, probably his last fight, go over that one. Uh, some more broken limbs, broken bones maybe. Um, some fun prelims, uh, maybe a title contender out of there. And some early prelims, a little bit of controversy and some stuff, uh, mainly just bad calls. All right, uh, with all that out of the way, um, make sure to like and subscribe. Uh, if you like what we're doing here, please uh, tell other people what we're doing. You know, comment below, uh, engage with me. Like, if you find something I say totally outrageous, you know, correct me on it. We'll have a discussion about it. I've made mistakes in the past, and like, I'll address it probably in the next episode, uh, especially if you engage. And you know, if you have an opinion on what we're talking about, if you think it something should have gone a different way, if you want to argue with me, like, please just engage. I like, I love talking about MMA, and it's it's like my the most fun thing to me in the world. So. I love doing that stuff. If you if you respond, if you do anything, I will talk with you. I promise. All right. <clears throat> so, a couple notes about the show. Uh, we had um, Brendan Fitzgerald, uh, John Anik, and Joe Rogan as the announcer team, the uh, commentator team. Fantastic job for the most part. I stand by it. Uh, what my statements either. What I, I might have talked about it last week or the week before. I really do feel like the UFC has that over every other organization you know you can say whatever you want about pay and fighters you know like who's the best of the best you know could uh, a champion of one organization beat a champion of another organization uh, absolutely on having a good night blah, blah blah we can have all those i think the one thing the ufc has that over everyone else is their commentary team that being said doesn't mean everything they do is perfect case in point please shut up about forward pressure if it's not doing anything like you can't bring it up in a way that doesn't sway the audience, you know, people who are just listening to you, you know, maybe for the first time, you know, coming in, like you talking about forward pressure when nothing's happening with that forward pressure. If I walk into you for 25 minutes, 15 minutes, and you just jab my face off as I walk into you, who's doing the, the damage there? Is it the guy with the octagon control? Uh, it's effective pressure. You know, I've gone over the rule set, you know, the judging criteria. It's called effective pressure. If your pressure is not effective, i.e. you just get punched in the face repeatedly as you move forward, it's not effective. Case in point, I think I might have said that already. Israel Adesanya puts on, uh, I would say, uh, one of his better performances. You know, he's doing this thing where he's got this Anderson Silva thing going on. Um, not in the way where he's, you know, super flashy in there because he's still missing that, I believe. It's just people forget about Anderson Silva's uh, streak, right? It wasn't all just flashy knockouts and submissions. There was a lot of stinkers in there, some really boring fights. Now, Anderson made them interesting by dancing around and playing and putting himself up against the fence. You know, whatever. I, I, that was Stefan Bonner, and that was a banger of a fight. But the point is, if you... If you look at what he's doing, you know, he's put together, what, three decision victory? No. He, he finished Co Costa. Yeah, he was uh, two two decisions. He's, he's, he, and he has some good fights, too. That's the thing. is, It's very similar to what um, uh, Anderson Silva was doing. And he's doing it in a, in a fun way where... You know, he's talking more crap than Anderson Silva did outside, and I think that's where the difference is, is, you know, he's not doing the flashy things in there, you know, the risky things that get you knocked out by Chris Weidman. You know, he's not doing those things. He's, you know, propping himself up and talking crap and getting at people on social media, doing a really good job, by the, by the way. I think that's him naturally. I think he's a fun, playful guy, and you can see it, you know, and... You know, that's where he differs, and he's, he does that outside of the octagon where it's safe, you know, to talk shit, get himself up, uh, prop, you know, get himself over on someone, prop himself up, prop the fight up, get the attention on the sport, on himself and his opponent even, and then, you know, getting eyes on him that way. Anyway, <clears throat> I think he's doing very much like that. I think he looked great in this fight. 
I this this fight went exactly how I thought it was going to go with Vittori just not being able to find you know success. I think maybe the first round could have went to Vittori because he did have that you know forward pressure, and I think they went one for one on strikes almost. You know, and that's the thing. No one mentioned about Vittori's forward pressure because it wasn't effective. I'm not trying here, here to argue that Vittori did anything positive with that forward pressure, but he was constantly moving forward, right? He was, but they never mentioned it. Oh, but if you go to, they say it early on in one of the early prelim fights, they talk about forward pressure and how that changed the fight. No, it didn't, right? If you get outstruck <coughs> and out damaged and you had more forward pressure, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much you walk forward or walk backwards. You lose. Um, anyway, a uh, great showing by Adesanya, spectacular performance, <clears throat> uh, you know, the, him and his teammate talking about their fallen, um, fallen training partner, uh, who got murdered, uh, that sucks ass, it really does, and, you know, as you could tell, it was emotional for both of them, so, great performance for him, as far as Marvin Vittori, I think Vittori looked good, I don't think he looked bad. You know, uh, but the, this, 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 this is what I was talking about, though, is I think Adesanya has improved very much since their first encounter, and Vittori has improved as well. I just don't think he's made the leaps and bounds gains that uh, Adesanya has. Maybe if they, you know, can encounter each other another two years from now, uh, things might be slightly different. Vittori might advance his game in another way. But uh, as it stands right now, I think that's how the fight should have gone and did go, and I think... Uh, you know, Vittori going down to fight Costa is a good fight. I think Adesanya versus Whitaker, you know, that's I've been talking about it. Whitaker should get it. I think that's that's the way to go. It's the most competitive fight right now. It's the most deserving uh, title shot right now. Let's get it done. Um, and, he, and Adesanya wants to do it in October, so hopefully we can get that get that done soon. All right, so uh, the co-main event, we had a uh, flyweight title fight, Davison Figueredo versus Brandon Moreno. And Moreno becomes the first Mexican-born uh, MMA champion. Pretty damn cool, huh? Uh, I, th I thought Figueredo was going to be able to do more because I, I felt like he did more in that first fight. But, you know, I think it's – I really do. I just – Moreno had an awesome night, and I think the first fight was very close, and I thought there's a chance Moreno can win. Right. If I had to put money on this, it, I, it would have almost been a 50-50 fight for me because Brandon Moreno looks better every single time he goes out there, and I think he could, he had the potential to change his game more than Figueredo did for the from the first to the second fight and adjust it in a way where he can, you know, flip those odds in his favor. You know, um, every interaction, you know, the power differential, that kind of stuff. That being said, Figueredo also looked like he just couldn't get going. Uh, I, I don't know if it was a weight cut again, but he's never been my flyweight champion. Um, I don't, you know, that's not not something I don't I care about really. You know, I don't mean it in a detrimental way to him. I just meant it, like it never felt like he was a champion of that division, right? We had the abdicating of the throne, okay, and then we had the shit show that was his first title shot where he missed weight, therefore making him not able to get the title against Joseph Benavidez. And then the second fight against an aged out Joseph Benavidez anyway, you know, like it didn't feel right. It didn't feel like he was doing anything impressive. Um, as good as he looked, it didn't feel like he was fight, uh, fighting the best in the division. Um, then he had that first title uh, title defense um, was against Brandon Royval or Alex Perez. I forget now. But Brandon Royval, like, I think he's going to be, it's going to be a fun fight for him to move up and, and fight Brandon Moreno. Um, great fight, though. Moreno looks spectacular. Uh, he, Figgy, Figgy is a little weak um, in certain positions, and especially in the way where he was saving himself. It looked like because maybe, you know, he was worried about his cardio, he was saving himself for later, later in the round or maybe for later in the fight, just never got there. Um, and Moreno has unlimited cardio, you know, uh, what we, they call that, that Mexican cardio. You know, there's just some, uh, there's certain um, places, uh, heritages, heritage? Certain people, you know, their ancestors had different hunting practices or they come from a certain area where it was beneficial for them to have very good cardio. As far as the South America goes, it was uh, 
persistence hunting, okay? Because there were no beasts of burden. So what they would do is literally outrun their prey. Not in speed, but they would run until their prey got tired and then just walk up and, you know, spear it. So <clears throat> if you're going to chase down a deer, like imagine that right now, you chasing down a deer. You're not going to catch it, but if you track it and jog, tra track it, jog, track it, jog, track it, jog, and just keep going, that deer is going to give up. Like it can't dissipate heat the way humans do. And um, because there were also an obese burden in South America, um, they had mile, they had runners to communicate. So when they're sending long distances, they would have these guys run a mile to communicate information. And they, like they would hand off, you know, like uh, some sort of uh, message or note or, uh, you know, maybe they would say it verbally, but, you know, you'd have a line of 10 runners and each one would sprint the mile or whatever uh, between villages or cities. So uh, as far as like that Mexican cardio that people are talking about, that's, that's what that is right? Um, historically speaking, and especially genetically, they have a propensity for uh, tremendous amounts of cardiovascular, um, cardiovascular health output and uh, um, volume, right? <laughs> <They're, clears throat> you want to talk about their VO2 max or whatever, or just their ability to process oxygen and stave off exhaustion for a very long period of time. And he, he saw that, you see that with Moreno, right? He just, he does not slow down. He just keeps going um, we saw it with Cain Velasquez, right? You remember that? You know, people talk about that too. There's just something spectacular about it. Gilbert Melendez, okay? Um, Diego Sanchez, right? These guys with Mexican heritage. Uh, it's not every person with Mexican heritage. Obviously, uh, genetics vary greatly between person to person. But, you know, given the right set of circumstances and um, genetic history, you can end up with... Uh, like high propensity of cardio. It's just like some people are born to be seven foot tall. Some people are born born and they're probably going to be five foot tall, right? You know, you, you can't help that. Um, you can maximize things for your frame or your abilities, but you can't. There are certain things that you have a higher propensity for. Um, and Brandon Moreno looked fantastic. Constant jab that, dude, his left hand was extended like the entire fight. That jab just poking out there constantly. And, uh, you know, Figgy had good position in the second round. Um, but he moved, he was on top and he tried to move in and try to hold him for, uh, get him in position for a guillotine. He really forced it and lost, lost position. So, um, maybe a missed opportunity for him. Uh, I don't think it wasn't a blowout. Like if you follow Twitter, everybody talks about how Moreno was blowing him out. Like I thought he was far and away the better fighter. Let's say, let's put it that way. But you know, there were certain positions where you could see Figueredo still, still very dangerous and can still win that fight. Right. And I'm not a Davidson Figueredo fan. I'm just not. Figgy's not my favorite fighter. Um, I don't think he's a bad person or whatever. It's just the circumstances that put him in the title shot, his attitude after he won the title the first time. Um, and then, you know, he barely makes weight for this division. It's just not It's not a good look, man. Like, you don't want your champion, like, coming out there 10 minutes beforehand to make weight. You want them confident, like, this is their job. You know, they do it professionally. They're not trying to squeak by and just barely, barely get there. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So how do you <laughs> talk about the next fight here, the Coco main event? First time the UFC has ever made a five round non main event, non title fight. Leon Edwards versus Nate Diaz. Weird one to do it on. Weird one to do it on. But thank God that line or whatever you want to call it, that barrier has finally been crossed, finally been broken. Can we please just get more of these? Right? Let's say it's a title contender fight, you know, number one and number two, or number two and number three, something, right? Like, we know that the winner of this fight gets the title shot next. But they're on a card where they're not the main event. They're the co-main event, but they're not fighting for a title. Normally, that's a three-round fight. Can we please just make it a five-rounder? Right, I think it warrants it, you know, like obviously we're not going to have a full card of five rounders, but if we only have one title fight on the card, this one had two, so it had a possibility the last three fights could have taken 75 minutes and there was only two title fights, right? It did take 50 <laughs> with the, the Coco main event and the main event, but um, Leon Edwards, how do you dominate? For 24 minutes out of 25, dominate's a strong word. How do you get the better of 24 of the 25 possible minutes? 
and still lose your title shot because of it. I'll tell you how. You take a big shot from Diaz, you'll get wobbled, and you look like shit for the last minute. Yes, he stayed composed. Yes, he didn't get finished. Yes, that shows more metal of Leon Edwards, and I'm glad I saw that part of him. You know, he didn't just give up in there, but, you know, he only had a minute left. Let's, let's pump the brakes, okay? If this were reversed, let's say Nate Diaz rocks him in the first minute, and then Leon Edwards goes to dominate the next 24. There is absolutely no talk about him not getting a title shot. I think it's almost guaranteed. Um, but part of the reason might also be because he just, you know, he didn't finish Nate Diaz. I mean, he was dominating. I mean, cut him open, which isn't, I mean, you breathe on Nate Diaz, you can cut him open. Um, and Diaz caught him, and he could, you could tell Diaz what didn't get up for this fight. He didn't care. He said, he even said it himself, he lost motivation for this in training. He just wasn't motivated. And he was still there until the very last second of that fight. In fact, you know, putting it on Leon, almost getting that stoppage. Like, there was a couple moments there where it's touch and go. If he lands one big shot, you know, the ref could stop, step in there and stop it. But it didn't happen. Leon Edwards continues to get his, uh, extends his winning streak. But he doesn't get a title shot after that. No title shot for you, dude. It just doesn't, you can't keep doing this shit. Like, he won his last fight via eye poke. Won his last fight via eye poke. And then in this fight, he gets rocked in the last second, couple, the last minute, and he's out on his feet. And it's just, it's not a good look, man. Like, it's hard to get that guy a title shot. I would, you know, Leon Edwards can fight, you know, Vicente Luque or Jorge Mazadal, Michael Chiesa, even. Like, put him against one of them. And, you know, I know there's people mad that he hasn't gotten a title shot. You know, he could have been the champion. Given the right circumstances, if he got his crack at Tyron Woodley before Usman did, I think he might have been cha- he would have been champion first, and he probably would have lost to Usman given that circumstance. But um, and yeah, like he should have fought Tyron Woodley, but you know COVID, and then he has really bad luck. His fights fighters fall out. Blah blah blah. I get it. It sucks, but dude, it is what it is. And he, given his opportunities. You can say what he want. It, like he's had his opportunities, and they've just he's. I wouldn't say he's squandered them, but he's just not maximizing his his uh, return on investment. Let's say that. Um, but yeah, he's not getting the title shot. Even Dan, uh, Dana White even said Colby Covington's the getting the rematch. Um, I mean, I wouldn't mind seeing because um, I mean, Gilbert Burns is fighting this Wonder Boy Thompson. And the winner of that should get the next title shot. Especially Thompson. Thompson has never fought Usman. Everyone else has. Right? That's the fresh fight. You know, Edwards had a shot at him a long time ago and lost. I mean, I'm not saying he's not a different fighter or he couldn't beat him now. It's just, you know, that fight's already done. That's already happened. And, you know, it's not a fresh fight uh, full of speculation. It's, uh, it's already happened. We can go back and look what happened. Or, like, we don't have to speculate. We can go back and look and see that he got dominated. You know, and that was just three rounds. What do you think What do you think Usman's going to do to him now that he's with Trevor Whitman and he's fixed up his striking? You don't think he can, Usman can hit harder than Nate Diaz? He's got the same cardio. He can hit harder. He's a better wrestler. What do you think he's going to do to Edwards? Like, Edwards has one chance, and that's a big knockout. Right? How? I mean... Maybe he outstrikes him, but Usman's going to play it safe and go in for that takedown and do exactly what he did to Masvidal in the first fight. It's just, it's it's hard to put Edwards in that position knowing what we know about him, seeing what we see. It's just How can we confidently put him up there saying that, oh, yeah, he's got a chance to beat Usman. There's n- he hasn't shown anything that shows that he's going to beat Usman. All right, um, welterweight, Damian Maya versus Balam Muhammad. Muhammad's stuffing every single takedown, getting the better of Maya on the feet. That's all it was, 15 minutes of that. Um, it's probably Maya's last fight. Dana said it's probably Maya's last fight. What can we say about Damian Maya if, the, if that, in fact, was his last fight? What can we say about him? Obviously, he's a legend, but what does that mean? You know, we say that about a lot of fighters. 
let's talk about a guy who has been in the UFC since 2007. 2007. That's insane. 14 years in the UFC. That was his seventh fight in his career he had. He was 7-0. and Ryan Jensen, Ed Herman, Jace McDonald, Nate Quarry, Chael Sonnet. Any of those guys sound familiar? These are back where those guys were in their prime. Gets knocked out by Nate Marquardt. Setback. Beats Dan Miller. Boring fight against Anderson Silva. Mario Miranda. Wow. Kendall Grove. Meh. Mark lost a decision loss to Mark Munoz. Jorge Santiago. George Santiago. Lost to Chris Weidman. No shame in that one. Dung Young Kim. Rick Story. John Fitch loses to Jake Shields, loses to Roy McDonald's, then goes on a tear for which he should have been given a title shot a long time. Alexander Yokovlev, Ryan LaFleur, Neil Magny, Gunnar Nelson. Remember that Gunnar Nelson fight where he outstruck him like over 100 strikes? Uh, Matt Brown, Carlos Condit, Jorge Masvidal. And then he gets his title shot. Tyron Woodley, you know, defends takedowns the entire time. Colby Covington had an impressive performance over Damian Maya. Kamara Usman, you know, he got Usman in that awkward position. And then, but Usman, you know, that was a super boring fight where Usman just staved off takedowns. Lyman Good, Anthony Rocco Martin, Ben Askren. Then he loses to Gilbert Burns and Bilal Muhammad. This dude has only lost in the UFC, and he's only losing to Tyron Woodley. for the, That was for the belt. Colby Covington, t- title challenger. Kamara Usman, champion. Rory McDonald. Title contender, maybe, hey, I mean, champion in another organization. Jake Shields, title contender. Chris Weidman, champion. Mark Munoz, I don't think he ever, good fighter. Anderson Silva, champion, that was for the title. Nate Marquardt, Nate Marquardt uh, title contender. The dude has only lost to uh, Gilbert Burns, title contender. Bilal Muhammad, and that's the last one, right? So we'll see where Bilal Muhammad goes from here, but. That's what I'm saying. He's only lost to, like, the best fighters in the world. And some of those, like, you know, he just just didn't get it going. He couldn't implement his game on them. But this guy has, he's what? He's only been knocked out. He's only been finished twice in his career. (laughs) Two times. He has fought... The best of the best. Not every fight, but 95% of his fights, 90% of his fights have been been against the best of the division at any given time. People at the peak of their career. He's He's only been finished twice. And in that, he's rattled off submission, 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 submission. Like, decisions, decisions, submission, TKO, technically. Submission, submission. Dude, it's just, it, this, it, Damian Maya is going to go down. If For those who missed his career or have only seen the last part, he's going to go down as, like, a forgettable character in MMA unless they prop him up because he just, you know, he never had a title. He competed for it two separate times, didn't get it. It's just... When you say one of the greats, this guy, he's just been there for 14 years. 14 years fighting the best of the best. He's 44 years old, man. He came to the UFC when he was 30. And he's been rattling off wins against the best of the best. You know, yeah, he's got 11 losses. Okay. But it's just, it's unbelievable what he's managed to do. And I didn't even mention the best part. He still pretty much only does jujitsu in there. Right? Good takedown, good at takedowns, pretty much only jujitsu. How do you do that for 14 years? People know it's coming. They know he's going for the single leg. They know he's going for the dump. Maybe a sweep on the bottom, but very rarely... You know, they know he's pushing in. They know he's going for that rear naked choke. They know it every single time. And he just does it anyway. Does it anyway. They can't, like, 
yes, 11 people have managed to stop him. Okay. But the other 20 haven't. And like, it's like, he's fighting people in the top 10, top 5 for his entire career, dude. Doing just jujitsu. How do you do that? That's how good he is. Okay. We're not talking about some physical specimen who managed to keep it late in their career. We're not talking about a knockout artist who gets a lot of early finishes so he doesn't have to fight for, you know, 15 or 25 minutes. We're not talking about a guy who goes out there and just outworks him with a jab or whatever and then mixes up his game. He goes out there, gets takedowns, dominates you on the ground the entire time. If he doesn't do that, he doesn't win the fight, right? But if he does, that's what, and that's all he does. And yes, people have stopped him, but all of those people were either going to challenge for a title or were already a champion. I mean, come on. It's so freaking good. Damian Maya, like, when he first came into the UFC, I was really hyped on him. You know, he rattles off a few wins, and then Nate Marquardt knocks him out. Um, you know, it, it, did, it derailed his title shot by, like, by one fight. It's not a big deal. It's just... Ever since the beginning, I've been a huge fan of his. He's so respectful. He's, you know, very honest about what he's going to do. Um, very honest about what he wants from the sport. And he's a class act from day one till, you know, if he retires. Now, all that being said, Bilal Muhammad, good takedown defense. Very good takedown defense. And, you know, you know, Maya's always had problems with his cardio. We saw it here again. Muhammad is able to keep it going. You know what? Let's throw him in. I, I've, I'm a huge, I'm a huge fan of Bilal Muhammad. You know, I don't think he lost his last fight. He got poked in the eye. That's bullshit. Just call it. Um, I don't want to see him against Jeff Neal. Um, uh, Neil Magny's coming off a loss. Jorge Masvidal's not fighting him. Michael Kies is a big jump. I don't know if that's going to happen. I don't know. He could fight Ponzinibbio, but I would give him someone who's ranked above him, and he's going to jump up after this weekend, probably in the top 10, hopefully in the top 10. Damian Maia's probably going to drop out of the top 10. Neil Magny seems like the right guy. Neil Magny's a good test. If you can get past him, there's a good chance he um, jumps. He could make it in the top five. If you can beat Neil Magny, you can definitely get up there and compete. Love Blum Muhammad. He's from Chicago. I mean, I'm going to root for him. Uh, he's also a super nice guy. Uh, all right. Light heavyweight. Gross fight. Paul Craig versus Jamal Hill. Okay, Craig. Craig's uses uses kicks to keep uh, keep good distance on the feet. I mean, Craig was so, so slick on the ground, man. You know, he, he was locking up that right arm. Like, he had it tucked in. And controlling Jamal Hill's uh, right arm, and he would hold on to it. Uh, he had um, I think he went for that arm once, or was it for a triangle? And then the second time he did it, he had that right arm locked up, and then he attacked the left arm, switch, like hopped, threw his leg over, put it in an arm bar, and snapped it. His, el his elbow was completely hyperextended. I don't know if his arm was broken or if the joint was just ripped apart. Um, you know, Craig said he heard it pop, snap, and tear. <laughs> so none of that's good. Hill did not tap. Okay? He did not tap. The ref is going to catch some shit for this, and he should because he didn't see it break. But um, Hill's arm was broken. They called it a TKO for Craig. Um, I think more fights like this should be. Or it, it, they called it a TKO because he was doing uh, hammer fists. Right, they called it a, a TKO because you know he had him um, basically in a triangle, and he was uh, hitting him with uh, hammer fists, and that's why they called it a TKO. But more, f I, we've been over this already. I think more submissions. You know, if you don't tap, that you are not submitting. Therefore, if you knock someone out, whether it be a punch, a choke, or a break. It is a TKO, TKO ver, ver, uh, via doctor stoppage, whatever you want to call it. It doesn't matter. Good win for Craig. He's a light heavyweight. Um, 
is a weird light heavyweight. He's uh, ranked number 14. This was 14 and 15, so it's not like, you know, they were um, too far away from each other. You know, put him in there against Misha Serkinov, Ryan Spann, Johnny Walker. Yikes. But, you know, this is where he has to fight, you know, some of the named guys. You know, if he can get a win up in there, it's light heavyweight. The world's his oyster. Two wins in the top top ten, and he could be uh, he be a title contender. Don't necessarily mean he he wins. I'm just saying two more, and he can get that. All right, some fun fights. Uh, Drew Dober versus Brad Riddell. Quake Riddell. Uh, Riddell getting the decision. Um, definitely getting the third round. I didn't have him win in the first or the second round. I think Drew Dober won both of those. It was very weird. Uh, first round, Dober rocking Riddell, both landing back and forth. Right, they they were strike for strike in the first and second round, but Dober rocked Riddell, and Riddell was wobbly in the first and second round, and that's the different ma- difference maker to me. You know, he did more damage. Um, Riddell, oh, <laughs> Riddell was like spamming panic shots every time he would like get rocked, which it's I'm not making fun of him. It's just fun. It, it, it is funny that, you know, these city kickboxing guys, they have the same thing. They're already fired up, get in there and smack everybody around. And then the second they get cracked, panic shot, panic shot, you know, and they should, you know, that's how you, you know, save your, save your head and get your wits back about you. So not begrudging him for doing that. It's just, they should switch it to a city instead of city kickboxing. It should be city panic shot. Um, on a serious note, uh, yes, he mentioned, you know, the death of his teammate. It's just, dude, I I don't know how how you would deal with this, like, leading up to it. You know, a, uh, a sparring partner and losing him in, in the midst of training for, like, a really big fight like this it really sucks. And, uh, you know, Drew Dober is ranked number 13. Riddell was unranked? Yeah. So Riddell's probably going to jump into the top 15. Fight was super close. I'm not mad. I don't think it was a robbery, but I gave. I would have given it to Dober. I think he won the first two rounds. Um, this was what that fight where they kept talking about forward pressure from Riddell or whatever. Dude, shut up. It doesn't mean shit. If they go strike for strike and they both do the exact same amount of damage, now we can talk about forward pressure. But that's not what was happening. Drew Dober did more damage in the first two rounds. From what I saw... And therefore, I would have given him the decision. Yeah. Oh, Riddell was rocked at least twice, probably three times. But that third time was in the third round where, you know, the end of the third round, Riddell rocked Dober. You know, I thought the third round for sure was Riddell. Um, Second round was pretty close. But I gave it to Dober. Um, You know, I think Riddell outstruck Dober in the second round. But Dober landed a, a few bigger shots that... Kind of shook Riddell, so. All right, Eric Anders. Um, He was spending Eric Anders versus uh, Darren Stewart, the rematch. uh, The last time Eric Anders threw an illegal knee, and they called the fight off, blah, blah, blah. He was winning. I mean, he was winning that fight. He rocked Darren Stewart really bad. The fight was going to be over, and he just threw an errant knee. Mistake on his part. He threw the illegal strike, and he was punished by, you know, that not being a win for him, so. Um, Air, Air, Anders was uh, talking about how good his, you know, his striking has been and practicing in Arizona and all this stuff, and it's just, he's still he's plotting forward and constantly looking for that big shot. That being said, he he was doing a really good job of holding Stewart against the fence, and you know. If that's a grappling exchange, so if you're on top of me on the ground, or you're controlling me against the cage, and doing the exact same amount of damage, I would give those roughly equal credit, right? I would say they're about equal. And Anders was controlling that fight, doing more damage to Stewart against the fence. It is what it is. You know, people were booing because whatever and I thought I thought Anders looked good his cardio was fine 
You know, that's been a problem for him in the past. Landed big shots on Stewart, went in, controlled him, and then in the third round, he uh, got put on his back, then he got a sweep, got on top of Stewart, and controlled him for the majority of the third round, landing some big shots near the end, and then there was like 30, 30 seconds left, I think, and uh, Stewart got up, but nothing was doing. Stewart was mad. I mean, you can be mad all you want. You're sitting against the fence, and you're doing nothing to push him off of you. Like, I, I can't stand that shit. Um, I don't, I don't like that. People playing to the ref. Fight the fight. The ref is going to do what the ref's going to do. Like, I hate that shit. Quit playing the game. Right? You want to do, I mean, the walk-off KO, I've talked about that one, how you can't get a walk-off if you don't walk away. Right? So if you go to follow up and that guy looks like he's defending himself, that fight could continue. Whereas if you land a big shot and then step away, there's a possibility that the ref just steps in and ends it, right? But you can't get that if you move in. So, I mean, I, I don't have a problem with Delos. I don't have a problem with people saying they got poked in the eye or hit in the junk. Because that's like, uh, that's almost instinctual, right? Getting poked in the eye or hit in the nuts or maybe hit in the back of the head, anything that's illegal, right? Your, your, your instinct is to be like, hey, dude, come on. You can't do that shit. Uh, grabbing the fence. Oh, yeah. And like, there's a couple of good fence grabs <laughs> over the night. Um, oh, yeah, Adesanya poked Vittori in the eye and kicked him in the dick. <laughs> so, you know, no one's going to talk about those. Everybody's going to talk about the win. Um, do I think those change the fight? No, but there's no telling. You know, it's these things. Like, you just keep you keep letting these fouls go and don't punish the people and they're just going to keep doing them. They're going to throw errant shots. They're not going to care. Um, but yeah, Darren Stewart was getting pushed up against the fence by Anders and he just kept standing there looking at the ref, putting his hands up in the air, even being like, Oh, come on. Oh, he's not doing anything. Stop. Oh, he pull me. No, fuck you, dude. Use that energy you're doing right now to throw your hands up in the air and complain to the ref and push him off you. Change position. Dig for an underhook. Push him off of you. You lazy bastard. Making the ref do your work. Shut up, you piece of crap. I hate that. I have no sympathy for those people. Even if my favorite fighter or the fighter I want to win is doing that shit, I'm not rooting for that. Right? I'm not rooting for them for them to talk to the ref. I might root for the ref maybe to break it up, to be consistent with how you know, they've been calling fights, right? If they're calling, like, a, you know, stalemate on the ground after 10 seconds of no contact or 15 seconds of no advanced uh, advancing of position or contact, things like that, and the ref steps in, I or it doesn't step in, I might call for it. Be like, hey, two times earlier in the night, 10 seconds went by, no strikes were thrown, no position was changed. Please stand, they stood up then, please stand this up now. Right, and especially if it's a fighter I want to win, you know, I might be rooting for that. But if the fighter I want to win starts bitching and complaining, like, "Oh, come on, he's not standing me up," uh, do something about it. Don't complain to the ref. You try. Either you hold on to him. Yeah, I'm not saying you can't hold on to him. I mean, that's that's pl- that's playing the game to me. Sorry, I said don't play the game. I didn't mean that. I don't mean bi- like I just mean don't bitch to the ref. That's like one of the lowest of low. Like there's foot stomps and then there's bitching to the ref about not no action. Dude, do something about it, man. Move. Ugh. Anyway, Anders looked fine. I thought Anders looked good for what he is. I think he's a fun fun fighter at light heavyweight and a tough challenge for anybody to get out there. He's a really tough dude. Takes leg kicks like nobody's business. Takes shots to that jaw like nobody's business. He's hard to put away. He hits hard. Um, he gets tired, but he still throws, man. He's a tough dude at light heavyweight. Uh, given the right circumstances, he could possibly pop into the top five. Um, starting to thick, The division is starting to thicken out, so I don't know if he's going to ever get the title shot based off what I've seen. Um, but I'm not going to totally uh, dismiss that. Uh, you know, makes a couple changes. He could he could put himself in a position to get a title. Given the right circumstances, I think there's uh, a couple opponents that he could definitely beat 
and put himself in a good position to get a title shot. Uh, we're talking like three or four fights from now, though. All right, uh, women flyweight. Um, Joanne Calderwood versus Lauren Murphy. Uh, they got this one wrong. Calderwood won round one and round two, and then Murphy won round three. Um, again, I, it's not a robbery, but they got this one wrong. This was wrong. A split, split decision. decision. Lauren Murphy, her attitude is very positive. I think a little misconstrued with what she's saying. You know, I get it done, and I win these fights, and even when it's tough like this and it's a split decision or whatever, like, I come out on top. Well, you didn't make it a split decision. You're the one who barely did enough work to get the win. And in my opinion, you didn't, and so did one of the judges you didn't. So, <laughs> I mean, she's a really positive person, trying really hard. You know, she's made a lot of changes in her life. She's had uh, She made a lot of mistakes early on in her life. And she's, you know, come back from that, um, straightened herself out and become a tremendous athlete. Um, but, yeah, she lost his fight. Calderwood should have got the win and then the title shot. That being said, you know, she could get the next title shot against uh, Shevchenko because she was ranked number three before this. I mean, Calderwood was ranked number six, but everybody else has fought Shevchenko in the top five. So, uh I mean, you want to give Lauren Murphy to Shevchenko instead of Nunez? Well, okay. I mean, if you want to see a murder, <laughs> I mean, really, that's what you're going to see. You know, she couldn't even beat Joanne Calderwood, and you think she's going to go out there and beat Shevchenko? For those of you guys on Twitter talking about Lauren Murphy's jiu-jitsu, I'm not saying she's not a good fighter, okay, guys? I, this is not a, here to shit on Lauren Murphy party, all right? This is being realistic here. We're just talking about her versus Valentina. Is there anything you've seen from her that tells you that she can beat Shevchenko? I mean, if I'm wrong, I mean, please, tell me. Tell me what you've seen. Maybe we can go back and look at those fights and then identify some... Strengths that she has over Valentina Shevchenko that I have missed. You know, I can't dive deep into every single fight that's ever happened, so therefore I might have missed something. But from the fights that I've seen of hers, especially this one, I don't see anything. She has rudimentary striking. She is a relatively strong person, but wasn't able to fully control Calderwood for all 15 minutes, who's not known to be a strong flyweight. Her striking is okay. It's bad. And compared to Valentina, all right, guys, all right, we're talking about her compared to Valentina right now, and her jujitsu might be okay, but Valentina is going to destroy her. I mean, if you really want to see a murder, then you can do that next. You want to see another Jessica I situation where, you know, this woman who is super positive going in there, I'm going to get this done, and then just gets destroyed, or Caitlin Chukagian. You name it, man. Like, uh, there's nothing. I'm not saying Shevchenko. Like, there's people on Twitter like, oh man, you you don't know. Everybody can be beat. I'm not saying Shevchenko couldn't be beat. I'm just saying if they fight a hundred times, I think Shevchenko wins a <laughs> hundred. I think if they fight a thousand times, maybe Lauren Murphy wins one or two. Right. I'm not even talking about one percent chance here. We're talking about a point one percent chance of winning. We're talking about the freakiest of freak instances that gives Lauren Murphy the win over Shevchenko. And included in those chances is injury to Shevchenko, self-inflicted or otherwise. I mean, congratulations on her getting the judge, uh, the judges to look at two judges to look her way, you know, and continue her win streak and then give her opportunity. I'm not here to rain on her parade and say that she's a shit fighter because she's not or she's a shit person because she sure doesn't seem like it seems like a great person you know has made a lot of changes for positivity for herself and you know the people around her you know i'm rooting for her as a person but i mean she's not gonna beat shevchenko <laughs> all right uh featherweights mavzar evloyev versus hakim dawadu dawadu couldn't stop a single takedown in the first two rounds. 
not one. Ivloyev, uh, great top pressure, good control, keeping Dawadu from regaining any control in the first two rounds. In the third round, Dawadu started landing some shots. Ivloyev looked like he was getting a little tired. All right, fine. But then Dawadu just gets taken down with, I think it was 45 seconds left. And that was the end of the fight. This is what it is, man. If you're, you want to get mad at it, fine. I'm not going to tell you what your preference should be or what you should like in MMA to each their own. But as far as I'm concerned, he put together a tremendous performance, you know, a Khabib-esque performance, you know, top pressure, crushing, pre like crushing top game, just suffocating grappling, you know, not letting you do anything, neck cranks. Um, Vlayev looks really good. He does. As a featherweight, there's some fun matchups for him once he starts moving into the uh, top 10 here. He, this was 14 and 15. It's like uh, in the light heavyweight division as well. Uh, the, the, earlier in the night, there was 14 and 15. Um, or sorry, later in the night, earlier what I was talking about. Um, Nivloyev was ranked number 14. He'll probably bounce over Shane Burgos because of this. Brr, he might end up at number 13. I don't know if he's going to move ahead of uh, Bryce Mitchell or Sadiq Yusuf. But there's lots of fun fights in there, man. It's in Barbosa. Nah, I don't want to see that yet. But that would be a good test, though. If you want to see how good... I'm not calling for that fight next. But if you want to see how good Ivloyev is... Plus, Edson Barbosa is coming off a really impressive win. So, you know, Barbosa needs to move move up. And I want to see him against, like, Yair Rodriguez, Chan Sung Jung, <laughs> Calvin Cater, Josh Emmett, Arnold Allen, Dan... Uh, I don't want to see the Danny Gay fight again. He already won that once. Uh, Brian Ortega, Max Holloway, Volkanovski. Those are all fun fights. I would love it. I would love it. So much fun. Love Edson Barbosa. He's one of my favorite fighters. Anyway, uh, but in some weird, you know, uh, parallel universe type of stuff, if you want to see how good Ivloyev is, let's put him against Barbosa. And if he can dominate Barbosa the way um, Khabib did in a similar fashion, or do like an 80% version of that over five rounds, we're looking at like a possible champion. It's just like that would be a really good test to see if he could do that to him. Um, doesn't, mean, doesn't mean much for Barbosa right now, though, so I wouldn't do that. Uh, Panny Kianzad uh, versus Alexis Davis. How has Alexis Davis been fighting this long and her striking looks just as bad as it did like freaking 10 years ago? <sighs> It's just whatever. I, I don't I don't get it. I really don't. I don't understand how you do that. I mean, I know people have lives, and this might not be their only focus or whatever, but I don't know how your striking looks exactly as shitty as it did 10 years ago. I, I, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, you should be improving every week, month, let alone year. Whatever. Anyway, uh, Kianzad gets a win, decision win. So one of those ban women's bandway fights that I don't think means much. All right, Matt Frivola versus Terrence McKinney. Uh, McKinney comes out, lands a nice one-two on Frivola. Frivola gets knocked out seven seconds into the fight. Not a bad stoppage at all. I mean, if he had let that go, maybe we see something different. But I don't, that was not a bad stoppage. I'm not going to argue that. Uh, McKinney with a tremendous uh, first UFC you know, appearance, and then jumps up and hurts his knee. <laughs> Fucking idiot. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, I'm not, I mean, he's not an idiot. That happens. Like, how are you exposed to, like, he didn't do a backflip off of the cage. He didn't do anything crazy. He just jumped up, and it's probably because he was a little cold because he wasn't fully warmed up from the fight yet. And then he jumps up and, you know, this is a freak accident. He hurts his knee. Whatever. I don't, that's not his fault. I hope nobody shits on him for that. Like, it's not a big deal. Uh, great win for McKinney, though. Um, do, 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 do. All right, so Hoop, uh, Chase Hooper. Chase the Hooper Pooper. Pooper Hooper versus uh, Steven Peterson. I mean, Chase just gets hit way too much. His head doesn't move, and his head his head's always there to hit. Hey, it's just... He's got a decent chin for a featherweight. 
It's just he's gonna he's twenty one years old. He's gonna have long lasting permanent damage. He's only had two losses and they've been, you know, pretty brutal. You know, even in the wins, he's gotten cracked so much. I know he's in the UFC and I know he probably likes the paycheck and the the attention and if he can parlay this into, you know, a popularity driven career in social media or whatever in announcing, I don't know, whatever he wants to do. Gaming on Twitch, I don't, I don't care. Um, if he can do that, then so be it, and maybe that's what he's angling at. But if he wants to be a champion in the UFC or any other organization, he really needs to take a step down in competition. He's gonna, He's just not going to make it, man. He's taking way too much damage. I mean, or that, or take a long layoff. Practice striking every damn day because his ground game is slick, man. Part of his problem is he's a little skinny, so his long legs don't allow him to tie up his opponent that well. Like when he puts the body triangle on people, there's still room to turn in there. Um, we saw that with Peterson. Uh, also, Peterson, you're a piece of shit. Yep, I will forever hate you now. Just how it is. I mean, maybe you come out and apologize, straight up apologize for it or something like that. Other than that, you're a piece of shit and I don't like you. He comes out in the third round and does a fake glove touch and punches Hooper in the face. Fuck off. You suck. No, I hate you. <laughs> I mean, why, why did he do that? <laughs> what was the... It's not the first one in the first round or anything. It's in the third round. Comes out for a fake glove touch and punches him. You're an asshole. Real piece of shit. Fuck off. All right, uh... Ferraziam versus Luigi Vendrami, Vendramini. Um, weird fight. So Ferraziam, he's like, he's finally fighting a guy who can't take him down. Was able to show his skills. He threw like forty fake knees, like that, like knee twitch, but didn't throw. He threw under. I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but my guess is he threw less than ten kicks up the middle, or knees up the middle that he was faking. Like, he looks so freaking hesitant in there. It's frustrating to watch him because, like, all you hear about is how good his striking is. And it looks great because he kept Luigi off of him and was able to, like, you know, do whatever he wanted on the feet for a little bit. And then the third round, Vendramini just comes out. He's like, fuck this. Like, I'm going to lose this fight. And cracks him bad. Puts him out on the feet almost. And he's, like, going after him and, like, just tearing him apart. Ziam cannot take pressure or power, and if anybody goes in for takedowns, they can control him. You know, as far as I'm concerned, that fight should have been a draw. He had Ziam hurt bad, really bad. That third round, he dominated. It wasn't even close, in my opinion. That's a 10-8 round if it's not a 10-7. I know 10-7s are rare, and I wouldn't give it a 10-7. But that's a 10-8 round. That should have been a draw. That's a bad decision. Um... Yeah, ZM got booed because people didn't agree with it. Like, how can you end a fight by getting dominated? I understand that it's round by round, and I've made that argument before, but this still fits my argument. I'm saying, like, in that third round, he lost so bad it was a 10-8. It should have been a draw. Um, uh, Carlos Felipe versus uh, Jay Collier. They got this one wrong, too. Uh, I think Jay Collier won the fight. Uh, sloppy heavyweights, but they have, they're have they really fast. So, like, these are, you know, big fat guys uh, who could obviously lose weight. Um, great example. Uh, they both have about the same build, and Collier used to fight at middleweight. And now he's, like, 235. So if you ever want to tell me that, oh, this is just how they're built, no, it's not bullshit. It's not. Nobody is built with 30 or 40% body fat. You know, even 28% body fat on a man is, I mean, unless you're – Going for a sport where you need mass, like if you're a lineman in the NFL or, you know, a sumo wrestler or something like that, and you just need sloppy mass just to take up space and have momentum, uh, I mean, that's just, it's laziness is what it is. You're just fat. I'm not saying you can't kick my ass. I know you can kick my ass. I'm not saying you can't. I'm saying you're fat. And you're lazy. And you're not doing, I mean... You should be able to cut weight. Roy Roy Nelson should never have been a heavyweight. That dude should have been a middleweight. 
Uh, anyway, uh, regardless of cardio or lack of energy, if you outland your opponent, it doesn't matter how tired you are. All they were talking about is how Felipe looked more fresh. Who cares <laughs> if you walk forward and you are getting punched and outlanded, even if you are fresher? Who gives a shit? It doesn't mean anything. I could have cardio for days, but if you punch me in the face repeatedly, it doesn't matter how fresh I look. Oh, he's not breathing heavy. No, but he's getting punched right now, so can we talk about that, please? Um, oh, yeah, in the third round, uh, Collier did get rocked but and then attempted a takedown. And up until then, because it was the first fight of the night, I was like, oh, yeah, wait, we can do takedowns. <laughs> I forgot that the fight could take place on the ground at all. Um Felipe got outstruck in the first two rounds while the announcers uh, were talking about how good Felipe's striking was. Yeah, this is the Israel Adesanya, Jan Blakowicz shit all over again. You know, the commentary being like, oh, man, Felipe looks fast. Felipe's good in the forward pressure. Felipe looks fresher. Felipe's got the great striking as he's getting outstruck and out damaged. I hate that shit. Wrong decision. Did less damage. That's the end of it. Um, I mean, it's a fun fight, and I think Felipe could be a fun heavyweight, you know, if he used his cardio instead of talking shit and putting his hands up and making faces and shit and kept moving forward and throwing combos, I think he'd be a better heavyweight, but who am I to say? Whatever. Anyway, uh, that was a whole card. Uh, lots of fights. I think it set the record, what, um, was it the record for the longest card ever being like 11 decisions or some something crazy long? Um, bah, 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 bah. Yeah. Uh, congratulations to Adesanya defending your belt yet again. Brandon Moreno, congratulations on getting the belt. Um, being the first Mexican champion does mean something to me uh, because they have a long history of combat uh, of success in combat sports, and we have yet to see that in MMA at all. And we see a guy who tr- not he's not just from Mexico; he trains there. He trains in Mexico. Okay, that's a big deal to me. Like, I'm not saying people should shit on their heritage or forget it. But all these people representing, you know, I'm from Africa, and I'm an African born this, and I'm an African that, or, you know, I'm a Canadian this. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm from Canada, I'm from Quebec, I'm from Australia. But if they train, like, the guys who train in New Zealand, in Auckland, you know, city kickboxing, they all rep New Zealand and they talk about it and blah, 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 blah. Okay, I'm not going to talk shit about that. But these guys talking about, like, oh, you know, I'm uh, representing Africa. I'm not saying they should shit on their heritage. What I'm saying is this means more. Because not only is he from Mexico, he's still there. He's training in Mexico. He's showing what Mexico can do. At least his camp can. Right? He's showing what Mexicans can do in this sport. They can become champion. They can defy the odds and become champion. Right. I don't know how many Africans are training in Africa. I know the infrastructure isn't there, but what you can't say is, well, look what Africa can do. Right? I know Africa is a fucking continent. <laughs> okay. Like, uh, look what, uh, pick a place. Look what Morocco can do. Nigeria, you know, these Nigerians saying like, oh, yeah, well, look what N- Nigeria can do. Nigeria is a pretty developed country, but there's not a lot of fighters training over there, you know. And, you know, I understand, like, Khabib, he was representing Dagestan. And I know he's he does train there and he goes back there. But he trained at AKA in California because that's where the best fighters are. So it's like all these fighters from all around the world go to these training meccas. You know, uh, uh, Thailand. People go to Thailand to train. You know, a lot, not a lot of people are going to Africa to train. Now, once the, uh, once the infrastructure is there, I think it's going to be more meaningful. You know, once we put the infrastructure, you know, into Nigeria – into Cameroon, you know, for Francis Ngannou. Um, you know, Morocco, South Africa. You know, pick other meccas you want. You know, Egypt is African, technically. But culturally, it's not really African. It's Middle Eastern. I know that sounds weird, but... It's the way it is. Um, anyway, uh, thank you all so much for putting up with me by myself yet again. Um, listening, uh, for making it this far. Thank you, Assam. True OG. Uh, yeah, um, I might get on later this week. 
break down uh, this fight fight night. Uh, it's Chang Sung Jung versus Dan Ige. Alexi Olenek versus Sergey Spivak. Tim Means versus Danny Roberts. Marlon Vera, David Grant. Uh, four fights are decent. Have some implications. So a little bit to talk to talk about. Um, maybe I can get Nate to join me. <laughs> All right, thank y'all. I really mean I mean it. Thank you so much. Like, subscribe, all that stuff. But first and foremost, comment. T talk to me, please. Someone talk to me. No, but really, um, comment. You know, uh, at Super Lunch Bros on Twitter. You know, uh, I, I tweet out during the events sometimes, but I've been you know more quiet about that lately. I'll follow stuff, uh, but you know, if you want to go back and forth and have a conversation, we can do it in the comments here. We can do it on Twitter or whatever you want to do. I really mean it. Like I love talking about uh, MMA, UFC especially. I do it all day with anybody who will listen, and I know there's people out there like me, so um, please engage. We'll go back and forth. Uh, yep, that's about it. I really I mean it. Thank you guys so much from the bottom of my heart. I've been doing this for like a couple of years now, and I know there's people out there uh, who listen to me almost every time, and I appreciate you guys so much. It means a lot to me. All right. I uh, hope everybody has an awesome day.